Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Halloween, happy Day of the Dead. Thank you so much for joining us for our program today. My name is Erica Griffin. I am the Public and Community Engagement Manager at the Chicago History Museum. So joining us today, I uh, have the pleasure of working with Charles Bethea, the Andrew W. Mellon Director of Curatorial Services at the Chicago History Museum, Associate Professor uh, at the Medill School of Journalism uh, at Northwestern University, Christopher Benson, our moderator, uh, Stanford Carpenter, cultural anthropologist and comic scholar, and last but most certainly not least, Vanessa Hintz, psychologist, and we are so very happy that she was here to join us today. So on your screen, you'll uh, find the question that speaks to the archival holdings at the Chicago History Museum. So the Emmett Till case is, is the case that is, is one hand very, very Chicago, but on the other hand, extremely national in reach and also in, in um, importance. Um, so in the collected materials that the Chicago History Museum has are some renderings from the court case down in Mississippi um, where Emmett Till and his, uh, Emmett Till's murderers were on trial for said act. And if you know the name of the Chicago artist and reporter that drew those images, please go ahead and make your selection on the poll right here. We'll give it just another couple of seconds. All right, so we'll end and let's see what our results are. And we have 26% answering Jack Olson, 48% Franklin McMahon, and 26% Bill Maudlin. Uh, those of you that answered Mr. McMahon are absolutely correct. Those, those stark and striking images were, were designed by him as he sat in the courtroom on those days. Um, and that was his first assignment was that case. And I can't imagine, you know, the the tension and how he must have been feeling, you know, having to capture these faces of all of the individuals related to the case and, and what that did um, to him as, as, a young, um, as a young professional and how that influenced his career going forward. So for those of you that guessed Franklin and Mann, you are correct. And to turn the Zoom controls and the microphone over to Stanford to navigate us through and bring our other panelists into the conversation related to Emmett and the, the sort of activation of archival materials. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things that we've been um, talking about in the virtual tour and also in the previous panel is that um, is the horror around space and place. And um, and particularly in the last panel, um, towards the end, we, um, we ended on a note that that's a perfect segue into, into this panel, which is that, you know, you have these, you have the, the green book, you've got all these delineations of space. And if you go outside, something bad could happen to you. And, and Lovecraft Country captures that, right? They go on a road trip and, and, and they encounter horrors along the side of the road that, that map very well onto onto some of the experiences of African-Americans just traveling on the road. Um, and then uh, we talked a little bit about, about, the, about the city itself and that, that the, city was not a, it was, the city was not a safe space, but there were safe spaces within the city, one of them being Bronzeville. Um, and then we ended on talking about how it all sort of comes full circle within Lovecraft Country in episode three. Um, we, we, you know, we have a party, we have, we have adults, they're having a really good time. And, um, and the kids have come along too. And they're, they're like off shunted away in the, in one of the back rooms in the basement and they're playing on a Ouija board. And one of them, Bobo is, is Emmett Till. Um, and what struck me was how, um, was how capturing him doing these things that a child would do. Right, as opposed to just thinking of him as a symbol having to do with, do with civil rights, thinking of him as just a child and what it means to have a child, to, to have a family reach this point where they, have, where they have the resources, where they can send their child down to the place where they, where, where, where they came from in Mississippi and, and, and they can send him to be with family and, 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 and going to be with family ends up being, ends up being the ultimate horror ending in death. Um, you know, I mean, it, I, th I felt that, that that is one of the interesting things about what this genre can do. And in particular, I want to lead up to um, lead up to to the scene where we realize that Emmett Till has died. We, we never see him die in the show. 
Um, and I think that that enhances the horror. And what we have, and if you can pull up the slide, is is um, just crowds of people, right, um, at the <clears throat> at the fu at the funeral, um, waiting to see waiting to see the body, and and Emmett Till's mother insisting that the casket be open. Um, but but we have we have we have some wonderful panelists here who are who who are much much better versed on this than I. Um, could, you know, Chris, could you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's, it's really an honor to take part in this, uh, this uh, conversation. I can say a couple of things just to open up. First of all, I did know uh, Franklin McMahon. I interviewed him when I was writing uh, Mamie Till Mobley's book. We worked, she and I, uh, Emmett's mother, worked on her book, uh, her story, The Last Six Months of Her Life. And of course, she talked about all the issues we're, we're talking about today. But I, I interviewed Franklin McMahon in the course of putting that story together. So I knew the answer, but we were blocked. The panelists were blocked from answering the question. So, um, <laughs> so there's that and may come back to that because I have an interesting story to tell about Franklin McMahon and his friends, his, his, uh, his children. As Stanford said, this was his first assignment, but he had many more in the civil rights movement after that. Um, I, I, think it's a, I think it's an important uh, thing to recognize that you know, this, this genre horror, I think is, is particularly well suited to, to deal with this story of, of black of violence, racial violence and, uh, and trauma. Because uh, when you think about it, the African-American experience is a horror story, right? And we see that play out in so many representational ways uh, in this uh, 10 part series, which is, is fascinating and multi-layered. The, the specific um, uh, elements of the story that relate to Emmett Till, I think are, are well done in that, uh, as Stanford has, has mentioned, they humanize Emmett. You know, think about it. This is a, a, a 10 part series with tons and tons of horrible scenes. I mean, really graphic, horrible scenes, but we never see Emmett Till's mutilated remains as we saw in Jet Magazine, in the Chicago Defender, and so many times since then. Uh, he is humanized. We see him as a fully developed person, a child in the, uh, the basement, as Stanford said, playing in a Ouija board. He gets a warning about uh, his, his upcoming trip, not unlike the warning his mother gave him about how he should behave in the South. But we see the reaction of all these people, thousands, tens of thousands of people who showed up at his, uh, at his funeral. His mother uh, made the uh, critical decision to allow him to, uh, to lay in state for four days and something like 100,000 people filed by that casket to view the remains because she wanted the world to see the horror that she had seen uh, as a result of uh, white supremacy of race hatred. And so the interesting thing about it is that what we see in this rendering is the reaction, right? The reaction of the people to the death of Emmett Till. And I think that represents the enduring effect of what we've come to call a hate crime but what increasingly the social scientists are, are relating to as, uh, is, as ethno violence. And ethno violence is more apt because I think it encompasses the true nature of, of the, this, this racial violence that we're experiencing here. It's an act of power. It's an act of power to make sure that people who have been marginalized in our society stay in their place. Emmett stepped out of his place and he was pushed back in the most violent way as a representation of white power. And so I think this is a theme that plays out in the course of the series, a series that as we've heard, uh, deals with place, um, it deals with space. I mean, it's, it's epic in the sense that people travel geographically all over the place, but it's also about our place in society and the, the power hierarchy that we're living through. We're living through in this moment now uh, in this current election cycle. And we'll get to that at some point, I'm sure. But the point is that Emmett Till represents this. Emmett Till as the first Black Lives Matter story in 1955 demonstrates what happens when we challenge the construct. And he uh, obviously was pushed back in the most violent way. We see that playing out in the streets today. Whenever a, a young black person is taken down by a white authority figure who gets away with it, the name Emmett Till is invoked. And so there are so many other elements of this. Dee will get to um, in her, active, uh, her uh, ability to turn her grief around and to become an activist in her own right. And we'll see how that plays out in the story as well. Charles, I mean, one thing that, I, that, that really strikes me about all of this is, is how we get to know these stories, right? 
um, and how these things play out, like 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 how we even understand the ethno violence. It it you know it's coming through artifacts, right? I mean I mean in the crudest sense, we could say that that to some degree. Uh, Emmett Till almost becomes an artifact, and that's the reason why it's so important that he's humanized. Um, but it's also the way it's the way it's in, imprinted, you know, in our public memory. It's it's through collections. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you. You know, one one of the things about the show and and the particular collection and the images that you see on the screen, they do come from the Chicago History Museum, and um, we get this sense of history and art imitating life uh, from the opening scenes of the episode eight, uh, Jigabobo, where you see these large crowds um, that are there to view this casket, and. The, the fact that we have that material in the collection, we have over 30 million objects in the collection at the Chicago History Museum, but this gives you an opportunity to put your hands on actual events and actual time frames and periods in history, which makes it not only exciting, but sobering at the same time. When you step back and look at our, our Franklin McMahon drawings, you know, it, it, he brings you into that courtroom. I mean, modern day cameras could not have done the same that he had done. And one of the things that, that I find fascinating about this particular collection of uh, illustrations and drawings that we have, you can tell he was a true artist. We have his thumbnails. You see on one of the images, that's just a notebook, um, piece of notebook paper that he you know, jotted down some quick uh, sketches uh, to capture the moment, capture notes on this piece of paper, and then go back and create these pen and ink and, and watercolor uh, renderings that were actually published later on. We have all of that, and you can view that, among other things that deal with a lot of African-American history at the Chicago History Museum. And, and, and Vanessa, I mean, uh, I mean, one thing that I that I really love about about your work, I mean, we've had many conversations before about this, is is in particular your work on um, intergenerational tra um, trauma of, amongst people of color. Um, you know, Chris has talked about has 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 kind of laid the groundwork for 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 what would for what was happening happening from a journalistic perspective, and um, and Charles has 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 brought it forth through, through a curatorial perspective, talking about artifacts. You know, but but regardless of how these stories are coming to us, they have um, they have they have a, a a psychological impact. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, um, and I echo everyone else's sentiments. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a little under the weather, so I apologize for um, the way I sound. Um, but I would say that. What makes racial trauma unique, especially in America, um, especially for Black people in America, is um, the pervasiveness of it, but also sort of this like socio-cultural historical emphasis. So unlike other trauma, where at you know, I, I experienced something and it was a, it was a moment in time, and I you know go through the rest of my life trying to cope with that. Whereas racial trauma, sort of to what Chris mentioned, is sort of it's all it's around us all the time. It's in our history. It's something that is again pervasive. And so for Black people in America, Emmett Till is Trayvon Martin, is Breonna Taylor. It's the same story over and over and over again. So this trauma that we experience is something that is almost hopeless in a way because it seems inescapable because it seems like again these stories are all around us and we're told that you know this is where we get our resilience and all of these different things which is great which is also it's, it's awesome and, and can be powerful but it's also again somewhat it, it's it, it's somewhat hopeless like I said because it's it's been this way forever and ever and so um, again that racial trauma is something that it seems like for marginalized people in America is almost inescapable. And, and there's all this, I mean, what I think is, is also interesting here um, is, is the notion of, of sort of vicarious trauma, right? You know, what it is to, to witness. And I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking in terms of the, uh, you know, I want to get to like to the viewer, but I'd also like to, um, like to open up to, to, to all three of you to kind of, kind of jump in um, is, is, what it's like to have to to have to document something like this, right? I mean, I'm looking at these illustrations. Um, I, that illustrator has to be a thinking human being, right? Um, and and I, I I'd kind of like to get a little get some thought about 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 what happens when we have these types of events to the people who are who are who are centered around the telling of the tale. 
Well, I can start. I mean, because yes. having talked to um, to Emmett's mom, um, I know what she was thinking at the time she decided to have an open casket funeral, which everybody tried to convince her not to do because of the what we've seen in what was returned to her from Mississippi and in, in what had been the beautiful face of her son, the tortured, you know, uh, brutalized uh, uh, remains. Um, but but in a sense, she flipped the script on the uh, the narrative that that is the image of, of, of oppression, right? Emmett Till's uh, killing was a lynching, okay, in every respect. And up to this moment, the representation of lynching and the spectacle lynching uh, experience, right, with people hanging from ropes, uh, from, uh, from trees and, and lampposts, was something that was controlled by the white perpetrators, okay? It was, a, it was controlled by the white perpetrators who took those photographs made them into postcards, sent them to faraway relatives as a demonstration of their power over the black body. It's all about power. And in this moment, when Mamie Till Mobley allowed, first of all, her uh, son's image to be um, uh, photographed and reproduced in Jet Magazine, uh, and then for the open casket uh, to be viewed by 100,000 people, she flipped the script on that. Now black people were taking control of the, the image in a way that empowered right? Because this turned everything around. People saw this and they could never turn away again. And, and this is what, uh, what, what, what um, she was able to do. And, and to the point about enduring pain, that's what a lynching was all about, right? It was to send a message to the larger community. Yeah, <laughs> there was punishment for the immediate victim, the immediate victim's families, but for everybody else, everybody else in a community, perhaps in the South, but, but in other communities as well, who thought they too, could assert their equality, that they too could step out of their assigned place in, the, in this society, that they too could reframe the image that had been constructed for them uh, by the dominant society. And, and I think to that point, Chris, also what you're describing in terms of taking control of the narrative, when we're working with people to process through trauma and therapy, that's exactly what we're doing, is part of working through your trauma is taking back that power that was taken from you by the perpetrator. So you get to rewrite the narrative in whatever way, like what happened has happened, but you have power in the present to relate to that narrative in whatever way you want. And so I would argue, um, I, I think that's something that Lovecraft Country did so beautifully is, you know, they they told a narrative that we we all knew in, in a way that was, you know, again, it was beautiful. It was something new for a new generation. But I would argue to your point, Chris, that's what um, Emmett Till's mother did in doing what she did with the open cast. It is she took she took back power of that narrative and she chose she chose within her power how that was going to be sort of disseminated. And I think that was her own way of processing her trauma and her grief. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and you, it, to pick up on your point about the enduring pain, I mean, when something like this happens to, uh, to a kid like Emmett, <laughs> it affects all of us. We're all victimized to the extent that, you know, if, if, if uh, well, my experience uh, early teaching at the University of Illinois downstate, there was Fraternity Row and there were bars on Fraternity Row. And if you heard about an incident where a black person was abused on Fraternity Row, you avoided that space. So think about that. Our freedom of movement is affected by the experience of this trauma that's inflicted on somebody else, but somebody else we identify with. And this is what happens. This is what a hate crime with ethno violence is all about. You know, it's interesting. I, on the same notion of, you know, reclaiming and taking back your power. I mean, I did an exhibition years ago at the Black History Museum in Richmond, um, which, which was on lynching. And we did not show one image of a lynching victim. What we did was we took a lot of these postcards that existed of these real atrocities and blew them up life size and put them around the walls and put all the headlines from newspapers and, and personal written accounts um, about people being there and creating this environment that made the audience walking into seeing all of this made them part of that lynch mob uh, mentality. And it put them in the mindset of what really took place. So you could no longer think that, oh, that was someone else or, or that was somebody else's story or I can't you know, fathom what that victim was, was, was experiencing because you see it right before your eyes. And this is one of the, Im the, the images that I think, you know, Risha Green had the power to portray in episode eight where she had Christina actually go through um, essentially what Emmett went through. 
and and you saw that as a as an audience member and not only was it very difficult to watch as a historian as a person of color seeing this particular event take place and then putting you know removing her white frame out of that um image and then replacing it with a 14 year old black boy yeah, it, 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 very powerful stuff and and so this is the reason why we got to get into you know this level of history and understanding not only what has taken place but what's still going on in our world today. Yeah, I, I like that point um, because um, that was a powerful scene. And for those who haven't seen it yet, um, I guess spoiler alert, but, um, but there's, a scene, <laughs> there's a scene in which a white character, one of the, the central characters in this power struggle, <clears throat> um, you know, it's a setup uh, early where she says she doesn't care about Emmett Till. Well, we get that, right? She's white, she doesn't care about this, this, this black pain. But later on, she experiences the lynching to the extent that she has two other people beat her, beat her <laughs> mercilessly, then wrap a, a barbed wire around her neck and, and, and tie it to a, um, uh, a gin fan and dump her in the river. And uh, this is exactly what happened to Emmett Till. And in that, we, we, it, it's interesting because we see this, perhaps this level of empathy, of wanting to understand the pain, but for, for the viewers, I think we also sense uh, retribution, right? Because we know the story of Emmett Till, right? Nobody has ever been made to answer for Emmett Till. And we got this white woman out there who set it all up, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and testified in ways that led to Emmett's, uh, Emmett's lynching. And so in, a, in, a, in an interesting way, we see the punishment for the white woman uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this rendering as well. At least that's what I took away from it. I think, it's, I think it's interesting that you see the punishment, um, but at the same time, um, and, and you know, I, I've been a part of some conversations, we also talk about privilege, right? Um, because this character, um, she has the, ma she, she, through magic, she knows that she's not going to die, right? So it's kind of like, a, like, like, like and, and I think that's one of the things that's interesting about horror that I love, I mean, Vanessa, I'd love, love, to, love to hear you speak a little more on this the way it can bring together so many narratives at the same time, right? You know, we can, we can, we can, we can get, we can see, we can see revenge, right? And we can see, but we can see other things at the same time. Well, I mean, what, what are your thoughts, Vanessa? Yeah, that, that was exactly my thought. Um, Cause Stanford knows how I feel about Christina and her entire existence in the show. Um, but I think that that was, that scene in particular, yes, like to your point, Chris, she went through all of that, but she went through all of that knowing she wasn't gonna die, knowing that she was gonna be okay at the end. And it was just the epitome to me of privilege. It was the epitome of, well, I'm just gonna try this because I can. It's like that scene where where um, Hillary takes all of them to the bar on the South side, like, ooh, let's go try this, but then we're gonna go home again, you know? And so I think that it's it's interesting because I think this is a both and situation like yes Christina didn't have to go through that so I can give her like a little bit of kudos for like putting herself through that and she knew that she was going to be okay at the end and I feel like it still didn't change anything about her or the way that she felt to her empathy in any way um but that's just me I have a bias about Christina <laughs> um yeah and I do as well and I totally agree with those points my point Ditto. is that this was this was sort of an audience interaction uh, moment because before I knew she was going to rise again, I, I have to confess there was a moment of satisfaction. <laughs> okay. oh, definitely. So, so definitely. That's, that's all I'm talking about. Yeah, I don't like the way it turned out, uh, but I did have that moment. I, I, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, uh, no apologies necessary because that, I mean, I think this is what's interesting about horror, right? It's a, I mean, as a genre, horror is very much about boundaries. It's very much about about that, you know, we talk about the things that go bump in the night, but the things go bump in the night, usually when you've done something that, it, that the culture doesn't approve of, right? You went into the woods you shouldn't have gone into, you know, you, you, you weren't supposed to look into the light. Don't go <laughs> um, in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What I find also interesting is we've got, we've got the trauma that Emmett Till goes through. We get the trauma of, of people having to see Emmett, Till's, Emmett Till as, as a representation, a warning of what could happen. Um, but we've also got, got a, 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 another more intimate story around D, Emmett Till's friend, 14 year old girl. You know, I mean, she sees this and she goes running through the, um, 
you know, running through the city and, and she, she, you know, she's accosted by a, by a police officer. She, you know, we can talk more about it, but, but I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to a little bit towards D because I, I think that, there, that there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot to talk about there. Yeah, I think one thing that <clears throat> Lovecraft did well with with Emmett Till's story, but also with D, is showcasing like black children as children because I think so often society doesn't give black children the opportunity to be young, um, and so I think that the way that D sort of responded in her grief um, is exactly how I would expect a fourteen year old child to respond in their grief, you know. And I think that um, the fact that she was then accosted by Lancaster and that whole disgusting spit situation, um, I think that we saw her up until I think, you know, her mom came back, sorry, spoiler alert, um, up until she, like Hippolyta came back with her, I think we saw Dee behaving in the sort of haphazard like way of an adolescent that I think that we don't often, that black children don't often get that luxury. Um, they're expected to be adults or they're expect, expected to behave a certain way because of society or whatever. And I think that that scene with Dee um, and, and Bobo and them are on the Ouija board and a lot of different scenes throughout the, the series, uh, save the very, very last scene, but a lot of different scenes with Dee throughout the series, we just saw her being a kid and behaving in kid ways. And I think that that's something that we don't often, that black children again, don't often get to experience. I, I agree with you. And I, I, I love that the um, rendering of, of Dee in this, this, this segment. And then from here on, um, because she's so layered and so that rebelliousness that you're talking about there, I think is symbolic of the, the coming of age of so many 14, 15 year olds, adolescents at this time, including John Lewis, we, we know, um, who identified with the, 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 um, the loss of Emmett Till and were activated by it. And we see her now becoming something of an activist in this, this segment, that rebellion gets uh, um, transformed into a pushback against, and, and this beautiful title, Jigabogo, Jigaboo, uh, playing on Bobo's nickname, but also on Emmett's nickname, but also the, the Jigaboos who pursue her, right? Who pursue her uh, in order to reconstruct <laughs> her image uh, the way society has constructed blackness. And she's running away from that and finally confronts it uh, in ways that uh, that challenge the the, the Jigaboos um, in their attempt to destroy her, to destroy what, to destroy her identity, um, and so I, I like that she becomes an activist in a sense uh, through that rebellion as well, because so many people did, right? Definitely, and 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 one of the things that, that you mentioned the uh, <laughs> the things that were chasing her, I, I feel bad now because I'm like I feel like I'm giving away story arcs. Of, if you haven't seen the show, but if you haven't, shame on you. I'll say it anyway. So these particular- I've seen it I want to see it again, so. Exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the creatures, if you will, you know, one, one light, one dark, I, I know pulled from uh, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, but I, I saw that as a little bit deeper than that. I saw that almost as a, a manifestation of a topsy-turvy doll of, you know, you know, uh, uh, black on one side, um, white on the other side that was reversed. Um, that was, I would say, somewhat popular uh, in, in, in the South on some plantations with some enslaved children, um, very easy to create and so forth. But to me, it was just, it was this creation of how either a, a, a black child is seeing themselves based in a mirror within society and so forth, where you have this dichotomy of your blackness, your black self, and then this other. And that's exactly what was chasing her. And even when she, before that happened, the scene when she ran away from the uh, downtown, from the church, from the crowds, and she was looking in this, this window and you see two of her peers come out laughing and playing and giggling. And she you know, is offended by that and throws rocks at them just saying, there's nothing to laugh about. There is nothing to smile about. So she had to grow up like many black children do very quickly because the way she responded in that particular moment. So again, that's why I love the show. It is so layered with nuance of, of so many things that you can take away from uh, the story arcs. I mean, one and you know, I I was a little more attracted to um, to, the, to to sort of a, a more metaphorical re reading where, like, I'm like, okay, she's literally being confronted by her stereotypes, um, 
and 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 now they're coming after her and and at first she's running from them right and then eventually she turns to to face and to deal and to struggle with them and i and i'll be honest it made me it, it actually gave me thoughts about my childhood like like how when you first encounter something like a stereotype you don't quite even understand what it is you don't understand how to react to it and um and and i think that that's something that that, would, that they were really able to tap and it worked better because it was horror um you know because it was like it was like because we had a category to put it in but that didn't necessarily give us a solution to it right um and then i loved how how like even in that journey like like she like how she how how she does grab something to make her feel a little safer when she grabs the the um the um the chicago american you know the the chicago american giants baseball cap right which throughout throughout lovecraft country is you know baseball seems to be evoked in in, in a in almost a um as almost like a protective way because like in, in the opening we see jackie robinson smite the smite cthulhu um you know there's a lot of stuff going on with baseball bats here but yeah i mean this idea of of literally grappling with grappling with your own distorted image, your own stereotype, I, I think is really interesting. Uh, I get the sense, Vanessa, you probably have some additional thoughts on that. I do, because it's interesting um, to your point, Charles, about you know your black self and then like sort of like your other like societal self. Um, I would argue that's like the basis of code switching, and for for black people in to be successful in today's America, it's like it's not it's necessary, you know, it's like code switching has evolved as like a survival mechanism um, for black people in America. And so I would, I, I appreciate that sort of um, like reading, I guess, of, of Topsy and Bopsy, I guess that's uh, the, those things. Um, because I think that it's interesting because is it is that then something that we have to confront as just like a harsh reality? Like I have my black self and then like my toned down self that I take into into the boardroom with me or into the bank with me or to wherever I go um, so that I don't incite some sort of negative reaction. So it's interesting to hear to hear that perspective because I think that um, I don't necessarily view that in that case, I wouldn't necessarily view Topsy and Bobsy as like bad because I think that to have my true self and then the self that I show to other people, I guess I would say that that's something that we all kind of do, but for black people it's different because again, it's not a choice. I think it's, it's almost necessary. And, and to that point, um, you said to the bank, but what about to Marshall Field? Mm. <laughs> what about Ruby? Uh, we talk about, I mean, change mm -hmm. is also a theme that runs through this in, in, in a beautifully rendered way uh, with the butterflies and, and, and other things we can come to, but there's Ruby. Right, who 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 resists at first, and then really wants to experience life as a white person, and experiences the power and the acceptance. Right, as uh, as the uh, the William character, or or maybe it was Christine. There's a lot of shape shifting going on in here, but but um, but but as one of those characters tells her, you know, uh, people treated you as a human, didn't they? Um, and so you have that and, and, you know, the struggle that she has with, uh, with her identity finally coming back to herself. But, but yeah, change is, is quite an important uh, element here, both as a threat, right? Because uh, the, the Emmett Till story connects to change. Emmett Till in real life uh, connects to Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, we talk about dolls. Doll, dolls were, very, were significant in the evidence that was pre presented there in terms of identity. But, but, uh, but, but Brown versus Board of Education changed the legal relationships of, uh, of the races in this country and was seen as a threat, a threat by uh, particularly people in the, the South, white people in the South. Uh, and that's what Emmett walked into and challenged and was, was, was taken down for it. We're facing a similar issue now, right? And the tensions that we're experiencing now are all about change, right? We're, we're, we're poised here on the cusp of a new demographic reality in this country. And some people are having some trouble navigating this new terrain. And, and that's what we're experiencing as well, which is why Emmett resonates. But change in this, this story is, is quite, uh, quite significant. The changes we're talking about with D, uh, and the, 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 the topsy bopsy uh, uh, creatures who are trying to transform her, the demon cops who set it all in motion. It's interesting that the cops are uh, portrayed as demons. <laughs> um, uh, interesting commentary there. 
Um, but 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 change um, as uh, as as I mentioned on the shape shifting, you know, Ruby as a black woman becomes a white woman and is empowered. Um, Christine, as a woman who has not gotten any respect in the family, becomes a man in order to assume that assume that power. But there's this remarkable scene uh, when uh, when um, Ruby is being transformed. Is that eight or nine or ten? I'm getting these all kind of fused now. But um, in one of the episodes. Uh, she's going through this transformation. In the background, we see this horrible scene. And in the foreground is a television set. There's a television set with a news report, right, about locusts, <laughs> about these locusts who are actually in nymph form coming from Kenya to the UK and yes. threatening life in the UK because they're about to be transformed from nymphs to locusts and they're going to gobble up everything. They're from Kenya. Did I mention Kenya? <laughs> okay. and, and to me, this is a representation of the threat, right? That is, uh, that is the insecurity of white supremacy and the need to push back against it as, as symbolized in, in that scene as well. Well, and, and one thing that's interesting is um, when we have a couple of questions coming in that actually slide right into this conversation. One, question, one person asked, um, could someone speak to the history of Topsy? How was her tragic story from... How was her tragic story from Uncle Tom's Cabin altered into a comedy by society? Um, and this person is asking for their brother. I'm, I'm wondering, because I, I know that, that I'm, 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 if I remember correctly, there are some, some things in the CHM collection related to this. I'm wondering if, Charles, you might have some thoughts on that. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any topsy-turvy you know, dolls in the collection. Actually, it's one of the things that I'm, I'm actively seeking. So if there's anyone out there who actually has one uh, or a, a link to one, let me know. Um, well, you, one of the things is we're, we're talking about change and, and, and identity and so forth. And even within Uncle Tom's Cabin, how we look at the characters that are in that aren't necessarily how they were portrayed when the, the, the book was written in the first place. And a lot of that still you know, is played out in society where you have, prime example, you, you have Uncle Tom who gave up his freedom, if you will, to stay behind, to save someone else. Now, you call someone Uncle Tom in present day, you're ready to fight because you know it's, it's a negative connotation. So it, and then it is so very much the same thing with uh, the character um, uh, uh, Topsy. So there's, again, there's a lot that is going on here that needs to be unpacked. And I know that um, if we had another hour, we could really get into it. But uh, I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna let somebody else, you know, jump in as well. Um, I guess we could say we've officially entered Q and A, but I want to keep it as conversational as possible. How much? How much does not having good white characters shape the narrative of Lovecraft Country? What surprised me as a viewer was the lack of a clear white ally as part of the main cast to help blunt the kind of racial trauma that the whites that that the whites see on screen. That's oh, Charles, you look like you're holding something back. <laughs> I am. I am. I, you know, it, it just from a personal note, <laughs> and, and I know this will get me in trouble, but it, it's so often that we look to see and seek aid from people who don't always look like us so it can give it, you know, some level of affirmation. Uh, prime example, before this, I was reading an article again, because I know, and I'm get slightly off of my, my sci-fi genre here. I was reading an article about the new interpretation of Candyman that's coming out and how that was based on an actual event that took place in Chicago and in, 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 um, one of the uh, uh, project areas, the, the um, Albert projects, where a woman was killed because someone you know, broke into the home coming through the bathroom and so on and so forth. Now, in that instance, it, it, it was more so of, well, here was this person that was writing this story that was potentially picked up by a name in Hollywood that was trying to sell it and said, hey, can we you know, use this story around you, you being the white journalist that wrote this particular story? And the journalist was like, no, because you don't need necessarily a white guy to tell this particular story. Now, in the end, the guy says, well, we need it because studios aren't going to you know, fund it if it's a black lead. 
And so here you have this particular show where you don't have a so-called white lead character. It is absolutely phenomenal. Your, your Hollywood is getting to the point on both large screen and small screen where they can prove that there's dollars to be made with particular good storytelling with characters that aren't of a different persuasion. And you can actually tell these stories and make money at the same time and have a deeper meaning. So no, I don't think at all that uh, Lovecraft Country needs a white lead, a white major character in a positive role to help carry this narrative forward. You know, I, I had a conversation with Mamie Tomogli, actually it was before we even did the book. I was introduced to her by a uh, Chicago playwright, David Barr in a meeting with David and with Raymond Thomas, a fine artist and, and filmmaker in Chicago. And we were talking to her about turning her story into a movie. And her first reaction was, it won't be Ghost of Mississippi, will it? And we all laughed because we knew what she meant. And if you know the Mississippi series by uh, Fred Zalo, uh, Mississippi Burning, Ghost of Mississippi, you have white heroes <laughs> in that piece in order to tell the story. I mean, the story, of the assassination of Medgar Evers through the lens of the white prosecutor, right? The story of the uh, the um, of, of Cheney uh, Goodwin and, Sh and Sh Schwerner uh, as told through the white FBI agents. And so what we understood that she meant was there's no white hero in the Emmett Till story, okay? So don't mess up my story. <laughs> Vanessa, I was wondering, I, you looked earlier like you had, like, like you were holding something back as well. It's, it, it, I, that question just reminded me of the meme that was circulating about Lovecraft Country that in a show filled with like monsters, ghouls and goblins, white people are still the scariest thing. And I think that it's interesting because a lot of like anti-racist literature talks about how um, if we wanna make changes in America, like white people have to be a part of that because white people have all the power, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so I think there definitely is a space for a white ally character that's not the way that we're used to seeing it in the savior type of um, savior type of character, but more so what um, Dr. Misa Akbar calls like an equity broker. So someone who utilizes their privilege to build bridges and you know what I'm saying, but then they go away. You know what I'm saying? Not someone who's here and I'm the savior and everything's gonna be better because of me, but someone who comes in, not to say that Lovecraft needed this because Lovecraft is perfect the way it is, but I do think that just like moving forward, if we're talking about just like, you know, history in general, and if we wanna change the narrative of sort of like white characters and predominantly black shows and films, maybe that's the way we should be going away from the savior and even away from just like them being demonized, but more so someone who can come in and be that sort of like bridge, that equity broker. Um, I don't know if uh, Hollywood ready for that conversation yet, but that's where we need to be moving. You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> we we have a, we have another panel, um, and it, a lot of stuff. Uh, no, not another panel, another question, um, and um, a, a lot of a, people are really are really hung up on Topsy and Bobsy, which which is cool. Um, it says for for any panelist, the top the Topsy and Bobsy creatures were invisible to all the other main characters except D. What does this say about them? What, where, were they unsuccessful in evading the stereotypes? Are they, are, are they already cursed? It's the first time I really thought about it, but, um, <laughs> but I, I took it as a representation of her struggle, her struggle uh, with um, this, this force that was trying to put her back in her place the way Emmett had violently been put in his place, right? To, uh, she's now on the cusp, as, as we talked about earlier, of of this more activist, of this more rebellious um, attitude, and she's being pushed back into the stereotype. That's how I saw it. So it was clearly her experience and how that stereotype ultimately destroys you. It destroys your, uh, your, self, your self esteem, your image and, and so forth. And we see that physically manifested in the way the char these characters um, attack her and actually transform her for a moment before she's magically restored, at least partially restored. More spoiler alert, sorry. They come a little late, but <laughs> I mean, that's I, mean how, I don't know how other people see it, but that, I saw it as, as, as her personal experience, struggling with identity um, at, a, at a point of her own transformation. I did as well, just for the simple fact that Lancaster says later on in another scene, you know, whatever it is chasing her. 
So uh, apparently the spell was of such that whatever your own deepest fear it, it was, was going to be manifested. And, and that's what it was. Because you got to look at it, you know, a 14 year old young black uh, girl growing up in Chicago, extremely well read, extremely intelligent and so forth. And now how society is not only seeing her, but how that, that, that something in the back of her mind that is haunting her as to how she's not only portrayed, but how else she could end up being. So yeah, definitely her own manifestation of, of, of her worst self. I mean, for me, uh, Vanessa, what, what was your take on that? I agree on all counts. I think that it was, it was sort of her internal stuff being manifested. So I, I agree. I, I also saw a little bit of um, the separation between the adult and the children and the child and the, the world of children in there as well. Um, especially given the, the way they positioned her character. Um, you know, all the other characters, uh, you know, as we affectionately refer to them as the black Scooby gang, we're, we're, are all like adults, right? She's the child. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be taking care of her. And they obviously did not do such a great job because she ended up being alone. But it was also interesting that that um, that Emmett Till is a disruption of her world of the ch of a child's world, and we and they maintain that perspective throughout throughout that that entire episode. And then in the end, when the adult when the adult comes in, when Manchos comes in and grabs her, like he grabs her right as she's about to like use her use her drawing skills to potentially cast a spell to get to save herself, and the adult comes in and just messes it all up. <laughs> But that, that, that's just me. I mean, um, we, we have another question here asking, um, asking what, what our thoughts were in terms of why we thought that the, um, that the author chose to set this in Chicago. I'm sure that, the, I know that there's a right answer um, if you're the, in the writer's head, but since neither of us are the writer, it's still an interesting thing to, um, it's still an interesting thing to, for each of us to ponder, I think. I'm you know, what, <laughs> what, no, I'm thinking in terms of like, what is the, what is, um, you know, what about what about Lovecraft Country being in Chicago makes it more interesting for being in Chicago? I, I don't know the right answer. I can I can kind of riff. Um, uh, Chicago is a mecca. You know, it was uh, it, uh, considered the promised land. We talk about movement. We talk about place. We talk about space. And Chicago was the place where people escaping the atrocities of the South uh, came and, and, and tried to start a new life. And we have a huge uh, story about the black politics, about black um, uh, uh, business class. I mean, this became a black business capital and all that. So, but then, <laughs> then you have some of the same issues, right? That people in the South dealt with, maybe not to the, the degree, you know, with respect to the spectacle lynchings and all of that, but you still have atrocities. You have these demon cops, right, who uh, attack this young black boy for just bumping into uh, what they what they consider to be a white woman, you know, and 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 considering that he's done something and they're about to really, really take him down. Uh, you have the discrimination at Marshall Fields. Mamie Till Mobley talks about that in, in, in the book, you know, that she couldn't even shop at Marshall Fields. Imagine that, uh, that Marshall Fields, a store that with, with the slogan, you know, give the lady what she wants, at least in those days, if you were a black lady, you had to shop in the basement, okay? So we have these representations of things that might have come across as softer, but still were pretty rigid with respect to discrimination. As we know, Malcolm X would say years after Emmett Till's uh, lynching uh, that the Mason-Dixon line was a Canadian border, okay? Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to look at, at this, this Southern exceptionalism, like the South was the only place where race hatred existed, where racial power was, was, uh, was manifest, but it's everywhere. We see this now, look at Minnesota, look at Wisconsin. Mm. Yeah, my take on it just simply is the easiest answer. You know, it's Chicago, it's the northern Mississippi, and coming out of Great Migration, depending on where that train line was, where you were, Mississippi runs a train line to Chicago. So Chicago is that mecca. It is that. It is that place. And you know, I, you know, as a, a comic book fan, sci-fi fan, I get so tired of everything coming out of New York. You know, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm. <with that. laughs> I would, I would also say too, like um, to Chris's point that, you know, we talk a lot about um, one thing that make lo makes Lovecraft so scary is, is the, it, it's like our real story. It's, it's like, it's real to us. Um, and I think that um, 
in Chicago, again, a lot of people who migrated were like, yeah, we're getting rid of all of it. We're going to go somewhere that's going to be so much better. And it's not. It's just veiled. And, and being someone who's lived in the Midwest for the past five years, uh, coming from the West Coast, it's, it's very much veiled. Um, it's still here, but it's veiled under this sort of like Midwestern niceness. And so I think that that in itself is, is horrifying, you know, when you think about that. I, look, at, look, at what ha- look at what happens to Letitia when she buys a house on the north side. And for those, who, for those in this conversation who aren't familiar with Chicago, it's historically been a rigidly segregated uh, city. The north side was white and you were not even allowed to go there. <laughs> you could get brutalized if you went. She bought a house there and we see the violence that was inflicted on the house. Mm-hmm. But I also, I also think what's interesting is, this, is, is Chicago as a Midwestern city. Um, um, one thing I find I find really intriguing is um, in in conversations about about folklore and storytelling is a lot of our a lot of American folklore. I mean, there's a tendency to place it more towards the South. A lot of it comes out of the South, and um, and so sometimes you sometimes I, I think that 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 putting something like this in the Midwest actually provides a a, a, a really fertile ground because it, it's actually the place that, that doesn't have a lot of this, a lot of the stories about race in it, in that, in the, in, in the folkloric sense, right? Um, you know, Chicago as a city is rich with stories. Um, but I find, I, I actually find it really interesting. And also that Chicago as a city is, it's not really close to other cities. So it provides this avenue for for travel through vast spaces of, of danger in the way, in the way, um, in the way the world is formed in this in this book, um, you know we're getting we're getting towards the end. I mean, are, are there you know for the panelists are there are there certain um, things that that we wanted to touch on that that we didn't get to? <laughs> it, it actually first of all, uh, it's it's interesting that the Emmett Till um, rendering is in episode eight. Um, eight uh, is the month of the year that he was lynched, August. Uh, so I just found that kind of interesting. Um, I, I look for all these points of connection, but there's something else that comes up. Actually, it's in it's in the final episode, episode ten, uh, full circle, um, where uh, Atticus uh, has this moment with the ghost of his mom, right? And he's having this this moment of self doubt. And, and I, I bring this up because there are a lot of uh, Christians who may have problems with the magic that's uh, rendered in this this piece. Um, but there are spiritual, uh, there are spiritual elements as well. And here's one where he's having this moment with the, the ghost of his mom. And uh, it's a moment of da- self-doubt, right? It's very Christ-like in that sense. And he lays across her lap uh, it, as he's talking to her. And it was reminiscent to me of Michelangelo's Pieta. Um, and, and, and she says something to him that to me, really sums up everything with respect to his role throughout the series. She says, you can't, uh, in this moment of self-doubt, you can't walk to the altar, right? If you're not ready to make a sacrifice. Otherwise, what's your purpose? And it seems to me that that's something we can all take away from this, this conversation, but also this series, that we're facing some challenges now, not unlike what, uh, what John Lewis um, represented in that uh, posthumously um, uh, uh, published uh, essay. Um, we're facing a challenge now. We're approaching the altar. <laughs> What's the sacrifice we're prepared to make? Emmett made a sacrifice. John Lewis made a sacrifice. He moved to the altar, the altar of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We're facing some, uh, some challenges now. What are we prepared to do? I think that's a great note to end this on. Uh, thank you so much for, for um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, um, thank you for participating in this panel. Um, I'd l- also like to um, thank, the, thank the audience out there Thank you for your questions. Thank you for the questions that we responded to. And thank you for the questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, I, I hope you guys are, are I, hope, I, hope that, um, I hope that all of you are able to come back for our next panel. Um, Erica, is there, anything, is, there, is there anything that you'd like to say? You know, I've just been sitting here um, silently in awe of each and every one of you. This was an outstanding conversation. And like, um, like Chris, I'm like, can we get some more time to, to keep on this? Because it's, it's so amazing. And the way that you all have not only framed the history, um, but, but pulled that history out of the show in a way that's encouraging our audience to think. I mean, the questions are flooding in. They are all so wonderful. And I'm, I'm wondering, 
Is there a way perhaps to get these questions asked after the fact so that we can share them somehow with our audience or even another conversation down the line, something, because I think with this type of engagement, exposing these more difficult histories about, um, about Chicago, um, exploring how they all intersect and they are Chicago stories, not just isolated to a neighborhood is really important for CHM's audience, for our, our citizens here to be able to think with an increased level of literacy about civics, about how they fit into this city and how the histories that have come before have led up to this moment, as you all are saying. And I'm hoping, I'm not saying decide right now, but you know, I would love to, to bring all of you back again to, to engage. This was awesome. Thank you, Stanford and Vanessa and Chris and Charles, as always. For those of you that are interested in um, participating in future programming, please visit chicagohistory.org slash events. There's so much there, so many ways to engage with Chicago stories. Also, we did develop a Lovecraft Halloween-ish playlist on Spotify. So if you are interested, please visit Spotify, type in Chicago History Museum, and you will see all of our staff selections there. Be safe and well. Thank you all again for joining.